Hello, welcome to Understanding ED Facility Coding and Charge Capture for Children's Hospital Webinar. Emergency care at, hospital, at children's hospitals has unique complexities from the front door to billing, which can create revenue challenges. The purpose of this webinar is to cover some of those challenges unique to children's facilities and then offer some ideas on how those challenges might be addressed. My name is Tracy Molina, and in just a moment, we'll be joined by our presenter, Elizabeth Morganroth. If you have any questions that you would like to submit for the Q&A at the end of the webinar, click on the icon with the question mark and type in your question at any point throughout the webinar. We'll gather these questions and try to address as many as time permits at the end of the session. If we don't get to your question, we will follow up with you one-on-one. -on -one. We will provide a recorded version of this session to all attendees in the event that you would want to go back and review the material, or if you want to share the presentation with a colleague who is unable to attend. With more than 16 years of experience in payer, provider, and vendor areas, Elizabeth drives the development of T-Systems, Encoder, Tool, and ICD-10 readiness services. And now to kick us off, here's Elizabeth Morgan Ross. Good morning, and thank you so much for um, attending this webinar. Um, first of all, I'd like to offer up a quick clarification that, again, we said that this um, is about facility coding for children's hospitals. So I'm just going to clarify that this is facility and not professional because the rules are different. So um, first of all, Emergency care at Children's Hospital have unique complexities from the front door to billing, which can create revenue challenges. Children's Hospitals have one of the highest um, averages of unpaid bills, according to an AHA survey. Understanding and identifying these unique differences can help tighten up processes and ensure optimal reimbursement. The purpose of this webinar is to cover some of those challenges unique to children's facilities and then offer some ideas how those challenges might be addressed. First of all, children don't often have heart attacks. Not to say that they never do, but heart attacks are more common to adults. Um, consider the differences between the healthcare needs of children. So, for example, just simply their ability to communicate uh, an 18-month-old may communicate in a different way from, say, a 14-year-old. And still a 14-year-old is going to communicate in a different way, uh, their, their medical needs in a different way from a 17 or 18 or a 35-year-old. So all those different age ranges and their communication abilities need to be taken into consideration. Um, they have special health concerns in addition to just simple physiological differences. For example, it's very frequent for children to have otitis media simply because of the shape of the eustachian tube. It's a physiological difference in a child from an adult. Children will present with different needs and a different, therefore, a, di a different uh, intensity level required of the facility. CMS guidance regarding evaluation and management levels for the facility charge are to use a consistent means of arriving at that facility evaluation and management level. There are several different methods used by facilities to measure this intensity, such as using the highest intensity intervention to determine level or various points tools. If a children's facility is using one of these measurement methods developed by an entity outside the facility, it's important to note that they may have been developed as a one-size-fits-most solution. Capturing interventions unique to children, such as a social work intervention, might be missed on a solution developed for all ages or developed for adults. Children's hospitals are staffed with pediatricians who further specialize in all areas of medicine, such as pediatric neurology, pediatric dermatology, pediatric endocrinology, and so on. Children who are followed by any of these specialists for a condition are more likely 
to present to the emergency department of the same place where they see their specialist. That is one way that continuity of care is maintained. Often, the emergency department physicians will collaborate with the specialist and have access to the medical records. In other situations, the emergency department is the provider of choice simply because it's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 360, uh, you get the point. It's always accessible. Care is available whenever it's needed. Even urgent care facilities are not always available. So if your child cuts his hand on a food processor blade at 8.30 in the evening while emptying the dishwasher on a Sunday and you know he's going to require stitches, the only place you can take him is the emergency department because his primary care office is closed and so are all the urgent care clinics. Because of these reasons, children's hospitals may see lots of low-acuity patients. They also may see lots of high-acuity patients as they'll receive transfers in from other facilities with seriously complex issues, traumas, and situations for which a children's facility is the only one with equipment designed for pediatric use. There is a great need for compassionate care with children and families. However, sometimes the desire for compassion can be detrimental to the financial health of the facility. As stated earlier, children's needs are different, requiring a different set of tools to capture the intensity for a facility service. It's important to capture that information accurately and consistently. The consistently Consistency is good not only in the case of an audit, but also when it comes to the revenue cycle. Sometimes a facility will write off a service simply because it's a service for a child and not perform the due diligence regarding whether or not there's insurance company. One example of this was a situation when a facility was ready and willing to write off the charges for a transplant. The child has private insurance coverage, so the financial loss would have been large. Treating children and their families with compassion when they are uninsured or underinsured is the right thing to do. However, often a significant amount of money can be left on the table by not first evaluating all avenues for payment. To avoid this, have a well-defined process in place for data gathering. Ensure those who are involved in the intake process are educated on how to gather information that will be helpful. Perhaps the process for obtaining information on the front end should be evaluated and maybe changed. It's possible to obtain coverage and payment information in a kind and considerate manner. This information should be used on the back end of the revenue cycle process to ensure that all possible payment avenues are explored before a decision is made whether or not it is necessary to write off care. If writing off care is common, examine why it is. The facility's practice management software may have a means of providing this information in a report. So if the report method is not present, involve coding and billing stakeholders together to refine a reporting method that is efficient and effective in providing valid and accurate information. Once the report is developed, review the information on a regular basis and learn from the mistakes made. Sometimes facilities write off charges due to lack of communication between coding and billing. I have personally um, experienced this while working for professional provider relations for a large insurance carrier. Often, I will speak with the billing um, staff when a particular service has been denied, and they will ask why that service is denied. And in explaining that to them, they will think that it's a coding error. And often, it's not necessarily a coding error because coding and reimbursement are two entirely different things. And the billing process is often very specific to the payer to which it's being submitted. And they may have different regulations and different payment policies that they place upon providers for billing purposes. 
So to overcome these kind of challenges, like I said, communication is absolutely paramount between the coding and the billing staff. So foster a working environment with open communication between these two departments. Another common source of lost revenue is failure to charge for procedures performed. Facility rules are different from professional rules. If a, if a physician performs a procedure in the emergency department, that procedure should also be captured on the facility side to represent the resources used in providing for that procedure. This is not just an example of lost revenue, but also consider that it's a failure to accurately report the procedure associated with an encounter. When I refer to procedures associated with emergency department encounter, I'm not only referring to fracture care or stitches, but also any substances that are administered intravenously. IV substances require varying levels of monitoring by the ancillary staff of a facility, reporting of infusion, pushes of medication, and hydration fluids are often missed by the facility as part of an emergency department encounter, even though they're commonly administered there. In cases where they are reported, understanding proper documentation and proper re reporting is also missed. This can be for several reasons. Coding for outpatient facility infusions is different from inpatient facility infusions or those administered in the physician office setting. Constant evaluation and review are needed to minimize lost revenue. Work with physicians and non-physician practitioners to ensure documentation of medical necessity. If you're doing a great job of reporting facility procedures or ancillary services that the physician orders, that's only half the battle. Reporting of a procedure without medical necessity will result in the facility writing off the services without any records on, on the patient if an insurance carrier is involved. Speaking of medical necessity, remember when we were talking about the fact that children have a unique set of health issues from adults? Insurance carriers should be taking, taking this into consideration too. Just because a service is denied for lack of medical necessity, it doesn't mean that it wasn't medically necessary. So, if your physician has a reasonable rationale for the service and it was well documented, it's worth picking up with your payer. On occasion, it may be worth putting in the effort to change a medical policy altogether instead of denying single or, I'm sorry, not denying, but a single thing. Carriers can and they will change their medical policy based on a sound and well-documented argument. Providing health care to children, it's a business. It's important to accurately capture and report all services provided by a facility. This is important for revenue, but also to measure the resources expended by a building or a staff who is available to the public 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you get the picture. I'm going to um, send the presenting back to Tracy so that she can give you some additional information. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I wanted to open up um, the webinar for any Q&A that you might have. Please remember that you can type in any question um, just by clicking on the icon with the question mark. Now it looks like I have a couple questions. Elizabeth, um, what are the biggest areas of revenue loss you see in coding for children's hospitals? That's a great question. Um, as we stated, as I stated earlier, part of a big source of the revenue loss is a point tool not accurately representing the resources expended by the facility during an emergency department encounter, um, maybe not giving the correct weight um, 
the children have a special um, pain scale just for them, the face of pain scale. It's accurately documenting that information and showing social work intervention when there's a child, especially sometimes children um, when they're having a procedure done that is, might be frightening. A lot of times social work will be consulted um, to provide special supportive care for the child and the family uh, so as to minimize any kind of um, concern by the child during that procedure. Okay. Um, does T-System provide chart assessment services? We absolutely do. So um, we're, we'd be pleased to do that. It's free of charge. Please contact us if you have any questions regarding the assessment. Okay. And the last question I have here is, uh, how does the facility know which procedures it can charge? Absolutely. Um, reporting of procedures for a facility is different from reporting the professional procedure. So, for example, um, a physician, if he, uh, if if a patient comes in with a fracture, for example, and the physician orders for the nurse to apply the splint, the physician is not going to be able to charge splinting. However, the facility can because the nurse which is a resource of the facility applied that way. So there may be procedures that are captured on the facility side that are not captured necessarily on the physician side simply because the physician didn't perform that service, but definitely the facility or its resource did. As stated in, in the presentation, another great example of that is um, uh, medication infusion pushes and uh, therapeutic hydration. And those rules for what is considered therapeutic for children is almost always different for what is considered therapeutic for adults. So make sure that you have those consistent rules in place and your compliance plan and then apply those and make sure because it, especially with the infusions, it can add up to a significant amount of lost revenue if they, those are not captured and reported uh, appropriately. Okay. Well, I think that concludes our webinar today. We'd like to thank you for attending today's session. And on behalf of T-Systems, thank you for joining us.